Hey guys, Zoo Adventures. Oh, I'm so excited. We should be. We are behind, behind the scenes. Behind, behind. Oh, that's like really behind the scenes. Really behind the scenes. That's it's a lot. It's something we haven't done this before. It's so exciting. We're going to meet one of the largest of its kind in all of North Carolina and almost all of the world. Ooh. How cool is I'm this? I'm a little nervous. You should be a little nervous. It involves a secret knock. Did you what practice you the secret knock? You didn't, uh, did you? You have like one thing to do, Steve. One thing. Oh, it worked! It worked! I did, I did do it right. Keeper Yay. Adrian's here, everybody. Come on inside, say hi to Keeper Adrian. Come on in. All right. Oh, this is so cool. Now we're just behind the scenes. And Adrian, you're going to go grab something for us? Yeah, we're going to go get the animals right now. Yes, that's so exciting. Thank All you, right, Keeper we'll Adrian. Follow you. This is great. All right, Keeper Adrian, so you've set us up back here with a, with a hellbender in this. This isn't his normal home, right? No, no, his normal habitat is much bigger than that, it has lots of areas for him to hide in. This is just a temporary thing so we can get a much better look at him. Yeah, we were hoping, and we did it, we asked Keeper Adrian if he could set us up with that. You don't get to see hellbenders very often at the zoo or in the wild. They're so secretive. And we really wanted to show off some of the really neat adaptations, those characteristics that help them survive in that special habitat of the mountains. This is so cool. Yes, we are. We're behind the scenes, guys, again. The keepers have let us come behind the scenes to see the animals. Let's talk about some of these adaptations. First, there's a hundred names these guys go by. <laughs> there sure are. So we use Hellbender. That's what we call them here at the zoo primarily. Can I tell my favorite? What's your favorite, Wendy? Lasagna Lizard. Lasagna Lizard? And, and you can see on the camera why it looks like lasagna noodles. That's awesome. Are the names, Adrian? What have you heard out there? Uh, my favorite's always good old snot otters. Snot otters. Yep. That is so cool. And they get that because of that slimy mucus they create. They're very, very slimy. That is neat. I've heard Allegheny alligators. That's a good one. Yep. Devil dogs. Some names like, come on now, look at these. Not a, these so cute. Let's do it. Let's do some of the adaptations, Adrian, since we don't get to see them very often, and then Wendy can get some really great shots. What, which you mentioned lasagna lizard, those, those really cool skin folds. What exactly are those skin folds for? So those skin folds increase the surface area of the skin. Okay. These animals actually breathe through their skin primarily. Oh, no kidding. With more surface area, that's more area for them to take up oxygen in the water. Is that because they're amphibians? We've learned that it, some amphibians take up that moisture and even and, and oxygen through their skin sometimes. That's exactly right. Amphibians Sweet. have a wide variety of ways that they can breathe. Yeah, that is so cool. And those skin folds all spread out through the entire body. Look at those feet. Don't they have little things on the bottom of their feet to help them, I don't know, give them traction or something? They do, you can see they've got some interesting little toes going there. And yeah, that's so cute. Despite having kind of a paddle-shaped tail, they spend most of their time kind of crawling around and walking on the bottom of these rivers. They don't really tend to swim a whole lot. Really? Unless they're disturbed or something like that. So they're more walkers under they, the water. They're more walkers, yep. No kidding. Even in the fast-moving streams, they're able to hold on with those feet? It kind of makes sense if you think about at the bottom of the stream, there's a little bit less current between and stones and things like that. Oh. Help diffuse it. So if you're kind of walking and pulling yourself up along the bottom of the river, it's a little bit easier than swimming in the middle of the river. <laughs> That's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. And then that, like you said, that paddle-shaped tail, um, not for swimming, not always. They can use it, but okay. yeah, it, it would be more of a sudden escape mechanism or something oh, like cool. that. Oh, cool. All right, good deal. And what about the overall shape of a hellbender? So you notice how flat and wide it Boy, is. Boy, they sure are. And you also mentioned that people never see them. No. It's because they spend most of their life kind of squeezed into pretty tight rock crevices on the bottom of these rivers. Really? They find nice little areas where they fit, they're comfortable, and that's kind of their home base. No kidding. 
So they're like a, a level 10 chill. Nice. They just hang out. That's exactly right. Doing what hellbenders do Today best. They might be my new spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> what I achieve, what I would wish to achieve. How about that color? You can imagine that's some really good camouflage. Oh, they just disappear, the won't they? Yeah. Just disappear. Oh my gosh, you can be looking right at them and not see them. Right? That is such a neat thing. I don't see any external gills. They don't have any gills up by the by the face, huh? No, no. You, you do see, uh, like I said, that skin serves a major... Oh, purpose. that's right. Yeah, sure. So that's where they're getting the oxygen is through those yeah. skin folds. Unlike sirens and things like that, which have those external gills, which you can see and visualize, these yeah, yeah. guys don't have those external gills. And these are, they're not the same thing as a mud puppy. No, and mud puppies actually have those external gills. Oh, mud so puppies do have yeah, the external yeah. gills. Okay. And this is not a mud puppy. No. You got on the eyes. I don't know, do they have any adaptation? Do they have like any kind of, do they have a third eyelid or anything like some of the other animals? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay. What's their main sense? It's just, they're just, he just says he's this pile of amphibian, right? So what is, what, how do they sense their environment? I think they do use kind of a, a sense of smell, for lack of a better term. Oh, yeah? For a lot of their <clears throat> sensations. I mean, when you're on the bottom of a river in low light, eyes don't serve that great. Sure, that makes sense. But I have seen them, it appears, locate food a little yeah. bit, stuff like that. Yep, cool. So smell or chemicals yeah. or something like yes, that in the water? exactly. Okay, yeah. so a little bit of both kind of things. Four legs, they are an amphibian, guys. They are an amphibian. As a matter of fact, correct me if I'm wrong, Keeper Adrian, this is the largest North American salamander? It's the largest by weight. I don't think it's the longest. Okay. I think, the, at least in North Carolina, the greater siren, I believe, gets longer. The greater siren. Look yeah. that guy up, guys. I'd have to look at the, the records, okay. if, I, if I remember correctly. So, and he's fully aquatic. These guys fully don't come aquatic. out online, all things considered. <clears throat> they can. Every once in a while, you'll see one crawling oh, you will. up. Yep. You'll see one crawling up on a bank or something like that, but it is very rare. Right, right, okay. So the so the life the life cycle is aquatic. Yes, they're busting all their that part. So they're gonna come to land rarely very, to very get from rarely. one point to another or something like that. It, I don't know if anyone knows why and a, <laughs> a hellbender occasionally pokes up on a river. Right, right. Bank. It's all about science there, right? We don't know. Exactly. So opportunities for us to learn a little bit more. North Carolina's pretty special for salamanders, right? We have learned that. North, they are. North Carolina is very special. We've got, you know, our wonderful mountain chain that just allows for tremendous salamander diversity. We go back and forth with a couple other states year to year on who has <laughs> the most diversity. But we know who has the most that, diversity. That's right. We'll say it. <laughs> that is neat. So many cool things. And this is a little one. This one's not very big. That's right. I mean, this is less than half the size of a full-size adult. A big adult. Can so this one's going to get bigger? Oh, yes. Like, how much bigger? Like, can you show us on this tote, like, how long it will get? Yeah, I mean, a full-size adult, you're talking almost the length of this tote. Oh, wow. With maybe a little tail move, move around. Little, so, so yeah. two feet the plus. Yes. Yeah, they, they get massive. and. <sighs> We, we have a bigger one in our habitat on display. Ooh, we're going to have to go out there and check so that out, check Steve. check that out. We wanted to bring our digital guests up close first because they do blend into that habitat so well. They sure do. Let's go learn a little bit more about their diet out in the, out in the, front, out in the habitat so you guys can see how these guys work in that space. I think some neat things to talk about once we see the space itself. So this is where we are, guys. Behind the scenes, thanks to Keeper Adrian, Keeper Allie Hyden over there. <laughs> We're going to go in front of the space now to see more and learn more about this amazingly secretive salamander. Wendy, I don't know what you're filming, 
But I think this box in here is really cool. Keeper Adrian, what is this? So that is a simulated uh, nesting area for hellbender salamanders. And really? In this one, the side's cut away so we can look inside. But is there anything in it now? There's, there's nothing in there. There sure is. What? I cheated because I asked Keeper Adrian, check this out, Wendy. This is so cool. Oh, wow. Isn't that neat? That is an adult hellbender right there. He's a pretty big boy. That's the, sure the tail is. end. And like I said, this is kind of a simulated nesting box. Okay. And these are deployed in rivers to provide these animals with habitat to use for nesting because a lot of the natural rock, rock crevices are silted in. Oh no! When you get a lot of runoff in these mountain streams, that, that'll fill in the natural areas that they use. So yeah. these help provide them some space. And obviously in the wild, you wouldn't be able to see in the side. That's all complete on this side too. And then there's a little hole at the end that they can poke in and out of. So are you telling me the zoo is part of this? Sure is. No yep. kidding. So the zoo is part of the group putting these boxes out. Putting these boxes out, monitoring hellbenders, working with wildlife resources commissions. Oh, commission. partnership, nice. Yeah. That's cool. And you started to talk about the, the challenges. Um, the siltation of the streams is a big deal, huh? So water quality is always a concern in these mountain streams. They're sure. small, clear, cool streams that these animals live in. And if you have a lot of habitat changes in the surrounding areas, you'll get runoff that flows into these creeks yeah. and streams and just fills in these gravelly, rocky bottoms. And it really ruins habitat, not only for hellbenders, but for the fish as well. All these animals have evolved to use these habitats, and when they're altered significantly by the siltation, it really ruins it. So how, how does the hellbender, what, so what does this, I don't know how to ask the question, so how exactly does siltation impact these guys? Because it's, is it the water quality, is it the clarity, is it hiding spaces? It's, it's the, the spaces on the bottom of the river. So, oh, so it's literally filling in. It's literally filling in, exactly. Naturally, they're going to be going in these rock crevices under big pieces of rock sure. on the bottom. But as you all know, if there's a lot of silt flowing in, it just kind of covers everything up and fills in these holes and crevices that these animals naturally use. I got you now. Okay, cool. Not cool, but it's neat that the zoo is able to provide these. And I guess they don't silt up as readily, huh? They don't silt up as readily. You can see, and you can position them to kind of minimize some of that siltation effect. But you can see there's a lot of space in there. And you also have the ability to monitor them and ensure that their placement is good and that they're doing what they should. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about their habitat, what they need in the habitat. You mentioned a little bit they need that clear water. So what are some other criteria that's going to help you tell if that hellbenders are in the habitat? They need, like I said, they need clear, cool water. It needs to have some flow to it. These clear, cold, highly oxygenated streams oh. are really, really required for them to survive. They don't gotcha. really do well in deep, hot, stagnant water. Which is kind of funny because if you look at the animal, it looks like it should be in some right, deep yeah. pool in the middle of nowhere. But they yeah, need it's, that flow, it's, huh? they need the flow. They need the the clear, cool mountain streams. Oh, and I'm hoping because you've got a little you've got a little surprise for our guests here in a little bit. One of the things they're going to see are those they've got they kind of they're kind of flappy looking, and I guess in, in the streams if the water is moving. You're moving the water past those those flaps, those folds. You exactly. are exactly. Okay. Skin is where they do a lot of their respiration, a lot of their breathing. Okay. So the current helps move the water. That's cool. Over that. Yeah, we saw those folds when we were behind the scenes. That's neat. The lasagna. Looking. You and your lasagna lizard. Oh, I like I like a good carp. It looks like lasagna. It's got the, got the folds. This one, since it's larger, this is much larger than the one we saw behind the scenes. It's a little less lasagna-y. Those folds seem to be a little more stretched out. It is. Just uh, a little bit than the 
This exhibit salamander doesn't like to miss meals too much. <laughs> oh! It's a good looking so salamander. So I have more in common with this one than I thought. So we're talking about the skin folds. Is that the only way they, is that the only way they can breathe? No, these actually have a lot of different ways they can breathe. Really? They've got, they do have gill slits and then they also have lungs, gill believe slits? it or not. Yeah, they've got little tiny gill slits behind oh, yeah. their head. Really? Yeah. That's so cool. I'm well, trying to interrupt you. That keep, I'm sorry. Gill slits? That blew my mind. Gill slits, <laughs> and they'll, they'll also even gulp air and use lungs. Really? Yep. So the skin folds themselves, gill slits, and they can gulp air. Yep. It's, it's great to be an amphibian and have all <laughs> these different tools. That's fantastic. And they're long-lived animals, too. They really are. I think they can reach almost 50 years old. I've seen, I've seen that. Yep. That's... It's hard to believe that something can just be, you know, cruise around in these rivers for that long. Yeah. That's a really long time. Yeah. Think about, think about what's happened in those 50 years in that stream or wherever they are. Oh, do you know, Adrian, and I don't know the answer to this, do they kind of stay in the same space or will they kind of go from stream to stream? They generally seem to use some set home areas. Okay. Like you can find hellbenders in the same general area and using an area, but these environments are very changeable. Sure. You have a big storm that comes in, you know, if you're living 15, 50 years yeah. in a river, <laughs> point. that bottom's going to change a lot. Yeah. So you have to be adaptable and you have to do some moving and some, some ability to change. Great. So adapt, adaptation, the adaptability, an amazing characteristic of the hellbender. So speaking of meals, crayfish is a favorite. Crayfish in wild hellbenders is a favorite. There's a lot of, a lot of concerns that some people have about, you know, hellbenders impacting fisheries, yeah. things like that. It's not really something to worry about. These animals really aren't that adept at catching fish. I imagine they would likely eat dead fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sitting or something that swims into their mouth. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> really a quick, healthy, happy, fish is going to be hard for these animals to catch. Instead, they're nosing under these rocks and eating a ton of crayfish. And using that, we're talking about using that sense of smell to find yep. some of their food. 90%, 90%, 90 of every 100 things they eat is a crayfish. That's crazy. And they don't. Some people do. They did get a kind of a bad rap for a while. As a matter of fact, I was reading at one time in the past, there were bounties put on these guys because they thought they were eating all the fish. And obviously, uh, misun misinformed there, they're not eating those, especially the game fish. Yeah, no, not eating any of those fish. I mean, it's understandable. This is an animal that is hard to find. Yeah, secret and hard to learn about. So people, you know, don't really know what they're eating until you take the time to do the research. And kind of funky, right? Kind of a different kind of animal. So when you come across them, you've got to think, oh, there's, this, is, this is not an animal that if, you're, if you don't know about them, you're like, oh, I'm not sure about this. It, it definitely has a look to it that I could see would make some people uncomfortable. It'd be a little bit, oh, I love them, but. And they're yeah. very large. So they can't that really big. Can That's a great point. Intimidating. Especially in the situation where you see them, you know, they're in these clear streams that aren't always all that big, and there is this massive organism yeah. hiding out yeah. under a rock. That's and you might be in your swimsuit, which already makes you feel a little scared. And if you're touching them and you're feeling them, you mentioned that Ooh, amazing yeah. nickname. Their nickname is the Snot Otter. Yes. They are slimy, slimy guys, and they, they are not afraid to use the slime <laughs> to help escape with. So what all does the slime help them do? So the slime is really good at making them hard to restrain. If, you know, if a predator <laughs> comes along trying to eat a hellbender, right on there's a lot of slime that really makes it challenging to hold <laughs> on to. Got yeah, slide out of the out of the yes. mouths and stuff. Yep. That's so weird. So the snot otter, what a great snot nickname. Um, and we'll come back to the, the idea of eating the crayfish, maybe controlling that population. These guys are, we've learned a little bit about, about this term with some other amphibians. Is this another indicator species in its habitat? They need some pretty high quality habitats. So, so the presence of them yeah. tells you something about the habitat. It tells you you've got a good ecosystem. And the absence is doing just the opposite, isn't it? Yep. 
So the hellbender, another one of our indicator species, telling us that if they're present, all those conditions are met. Fresh water, clean water, moving water, highly oxygenated, not as much silt in the space. So they're indicating, they're telling us that that space is a healthy space for the hellbenders. And I'm assuming other animals too. I mean, there's a lot of fish in here too. And we'll talk about those guys in a minute. So it kind of tells us a little bit about everything going there, on. There's a huge diversity of fish in these small streams that these hellbenders are living in. And a lot of times, people don't even realize it. You sure. Know, you think of your game fish that you find in the mountain streams. But there are all kinds of different shiners, dace, garters, just huge, huge diversity in the streams. And some really pretty fish doing some cool things. That's so cool. Well, I think we should learn a little bit about those fish. So everybody, this is Keeper Alley. Say hi to Keeper Alley out there. Hi guys. Right hi. now, people are waving to you. Yeah, yeah. you just people can't see them. You just yeah. can't see it. And you can't see that she's smiling, so they, yeah. they're all at a disadvantage. <laughs> That'll work. So we're at fish. Yes. Can it, is it safe to assume that these fish can be found in the same space as a hellbender? They can. Some of them? Yeah, some of them, you know. I mean, we have them with our hellbender now. Yeah. Um, but all these guys you can find down southeast, throughout the east coast. You find them all in here in North Carolina. That is so cool. It's such a pretty space. Can you tell any of the fish? Can you tell us who's who in there a little bit? There's yeah. so many. So the and one that she's on, on right <laughs> now is one of the daces. That's the rosy side dace. You rosy see? side Those dace. Those colors are really pretty. Yeah. That guy is one of the green fin shiners. So there's dace shiners. and shiners. Yeah. Okay. And there's a darter in here, but he's really hidden. He's darting somewhere. Ah, <laughs> must be where he gets their name, maybe. It's so cool. There's so many fish. Um, can, we, can, we, can we talk about my favorite fish in here? You have a favorite fish in there? Yes, he he, uh, how do you... he moved all these rocks. He's sort of like an interior designer. Hmm, no, Wendy. Wendy. He is. We've got to tell the truth. I am. On, the, on, the, on our zoo adventures, we need to make sure that we're telling the truth. You're telling me that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an architectural engineer fish. Well, why don't you ask our expert and we'll, she'll tell us. I'm going to because, you know, I want to find out. Is there really an architectural engineer in there as a fish? Surprisingly, yes, there is. Oh, ah, Keeper Alley, you're killing me. <laughs> Which uh, one is it? That guy is called a blue-headed chub. A blue-headed chub, and he is a engineer. He is. How, what does he do? So, he likes to move rocks and create some little mounds, and it's for mating. So for the Are you eating? telling yes. me he built this? He did. He built both of those? Mm -hmm. Let me get it from this angle, because the angle I'm at, you can't really see. There's two separate mounds and then a whole bunch of naked space. And those aren't little. No. He works hard for them. Put your hand up there, Allie. So they can't see you much. Put your hand up there so they can see an idea. So, Look how big that is, guys. That's a big old man. He moved those rocks? Yep. Blue-headed chub. So he moves them, it's not like a nest, but does it like show the other females like how strong he is or how? It's more like it's kind of like, hey, this is my mound. It's different from this guy's mound. It's bigger, it's nicer. Oh. He chooses his rocks that he wants to use. So right now he's not really doing it because Wendy has it on him right now. Mm -hmm. um, but he'll go through the whole side looking for a special rock. Like the perfect rock. Yeah. And it looks, and I, I'm going to make this up because I don't have any idea if it's true. Looks like he's left some of the gray rocks behind and he's pulled forward yeah. some of these the earth toned pretty, rocks. Yeah, the colored, prettier rocks. Yeah. So that's normal or not, but that's kind of a neat observation <laughs> in the space. What are the, what are the bumps on his head? So th those are little tubercles. Um, they get it when they're ready to mate and it shows oh. kind of off to the female too. So he's, he's putting on his mating, his mating colors. Yeah. And then what's this other big fish to the left of him? That is another type of chub. That is a creek chub. Creek chub, bluehead chub, sh dace, shiners, darters. 
And all these guys are kind of found in the same space, huh? Mm-hmm. That they are. So neat. Diet? Diet, they eat like small inverts, um, little like just insects, mm -hmm. other things like that that they can actually eat. Here we feed them a uh, different type of like so cool. shrimp, yeah. so like small little shrimp. They get flake food, they like that. Um, but yeah. So here's another one of our neat things, and we don't talk, I mean, it's, it's, it's so cool. Wendy, we've talked about this a few times. So these are meat eaters, Wendy. This is a carnivorous. They're carnivorous. That's so cool, right? Yeah. When I think of a carnivorous fish, I immediately think of piranha. And sharks. And <laughs> you know, I don't think of a salamander as a predator, but it is. Yes. So when you t put these labels sometimes in different contexts, it's really cool to think about. These yep. fish are predators. They're meat eaters. They're carnivores. They are hunters. They're hunters. It's so cool. It is. I think it's so much fun. So, unfair question. You may not have an answer to this one. It just. I look in there. There's a lot of fish here. <laughs> Do you have any idea, Allie, how many fish you have? Oh man, we just did our inventory too. Um, that is a good question. So on a nor normally you you know like we have 12 of these shiners and we yeah. have 16 female and four male of well, this. Sometimes, like a fishing lure. It is kind of hard to tell the difference between a male and a female when they're not showing their mating. Oh, oh that's good to know. That is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, so not like you want like a cardinal bird. You always know the cardinal male, mm -hmm. and you don't do that in fish, huh? Well, you can't, especially during like the mating season. The males get like the really bright colors mm -hmm. and those of these, and that that's when we can tell um, when the. Blue Headed Tails first started making his mounds. All the yellow fin shiners um, got very, very red on their sides. So, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. I bet this is just a dynamic place. And this really does mimic that where they would live in the wild. So you have your trees and your rocks and the different, um, well, here it's filtration, the water coming in. So it's not at, like they were saying earlier, a stagnant pool of water. There's flow to it yes. underneath and on top. Yes. So neat. Cool. I like this guy. Do you know who this is? That's the rosy sided dace. Rosy sided dace. I love the little sparkles. Some of you guys can see it. Our digital guests can see those sparkles on the top. Half of his <laughs> body, his, her, its body. There, there's that <laughs> you didn't see it, Sally, went, or uh, uh, Allie just kind of shrugged her shoulders. Like, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a neat, and it's such a neat space. Allie, are these two, have, we saw hellbenders, are these two habitats connected? They are connected. So you have this big log here in the middle, and yep. there's a screen that the fish can fit through and go to the two sides whenever they want. So the fish can, but the hellbender cannot. Surprisingly, the hellbender can move. That big old hellbender can get over there? He, yep, he usually climbs up on top. Really? And then he'll slide down. Uh -huh. Or he'll like to come over this rock. That tricky little salamander. <laughs> that tricky little salamander. Yeah. Big old salamander. He, yep. <laughs> that is so neat. And here, if we have a video here. It's, it is showing sort of the same ecosystem. This was actually taken in the wild. There's some toe beans sticking out right there. Nice catch. Look how it blends in. Just disappears. Holy moly. Just simply disappears. There's the walking that Adrian has mentioned before. A great video. And all this stuff can be found in the western part of North Carolina, in, those, in the mountain streams yes. of North Carolina. So these, these guys are found right here in the Tar Heel State. Mostly help in the world, you're finding them in the western part of the state in the mountains, the cool mountain streams mm -hmm. that are flowing quickly. That's amazing stuff. What should our keepers, what should our, our keepers, what should our digital guests know about the fish? What would you want them to walk away with knowing on these guys? You know, some of these guys aren't, um, like they're least concerned and stuff, but it does help to keep the water pollution down because they are kind of like not they're not keystone animals but they do help maintain ecosystems gotcha 
So they've got a pretty important role to play mm -hmm. as, well, as can, individuals. And I as can as imagine a lot of our digital guests, too, can't imagine streams without fish. Right. Good point. You know, I, not just for helping the ecosystem, but also there are people that, you know, like to go fishing. And that does help conservation. You wouldn't think that fishermen or hunters, um, what their that sport does help conservation. Almost by definition, right? Ooh, maybe you'll pick up a rock. I think you're cute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Keeper Alley, thank you so much for introducing us to the, all the huge variety. I don't know how you do it, <laughs> Keeper Alley. So hats off to you, being able to figure out who's in there, what's in there, and what's going on. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Amazing habitat. And you've really got to take the time to visit. You've got to take the time to see. So when you're here at the zoo, when you're looking at animals, guys, take your time. When you're in the aviary, look up and walk slow in the desert. Look around. When you come to the North Carolina Zoo Streamside Habitat, which is where we are now, just stop for a little bit and take a look at each individual fish. Figure out who's who and use those amazing observation skills you guys have to look for a hellbender. There's a couple few in there all the time. And it's relaxing. It's calm. It's cool. Watching these guys and hearing the water flow. Yep. It's a really neat space. The keepers do a great job of keeping everything nice and clean, clear so you guys can see them. Who knew? Who knew all this was going on? The hellbenders, the fish, amazing animals, and the conservation efforts the zoo is part of. Putting those boxes out, those concrete boxes that might weigh 100 pounds, They've got to tote, the, tote those down into the streams on their own, giving the hellbenders a chance to survive. They can breed in there, nest in there, and hang out inside there. It's amazing stuff. Hope you guys have a great time. From the Zoo Adventures team, Wendy behind the camera, Steve's in front. We had Keeper Adrian and Keeper Allie with us today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and learning more about Streamside Habitat. Remember, Zoo Adventures is with you Mondays and Wednesdays. 10 o'clock. The zoo is open. Check the website for the criteria and the efforts to get in. Can't wait to see you. Stay safe. Bye, everybody.